Okay, thank you, Teresa. Uh, before we get underway with the presentation, uh, Diksha Dahal and myself would like to just say a little bit more about who we are. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Environmental Sustainability at Loyola. I'm originally um, from the from Northern Illinois. I grew up in the Rockford area, uh, but I'm relatively new to research focused on food systems. So my research has been focused around topics like community engagement and environmental management, environmental education, and environmental justice. But the work that we're sharing today is a new direction um, that I've been heading focused around uh, food justice and resilience within regional food systems. And I have some prior uh, practitioner experience with food systems in Finger Lakes, the Finger Lakes region of New York and the Mananak region of New Hampshire. I lived in the Northeastern US for roughly a decade, um, but I'm, I'm new to this space here in Chicago. And I know that there's so much really good work that's happening in the Chicago region to promote food justice. And so um, we're just really thrilled to have the opportunity to share with you all the work that we've been engaged in, but also to learn from you, to get your feedback, your comments, your thoughts um, as well. Diksha is also relatively new to this space, but brings um, experience in community development in her home country of Nepal. And I'd like to invite Diksha to tell you a little bit more about herself. Thank you, Professor Susler. Hello, everyone. I am Diksha Dahal. Um, I'm a graduate student in environmental science and sustainability at Loyola. And I was born and raised in Nepal, where I completed my education in environmental science from Kathmandu University, Nepal. And um, I'm interested in working in community-based projects, which addresses environmental and health issues. And that is where my experiences come from. Um, I have worked in different nonprofit organizations in Nepal, uh, focusing on health, education, livelihood, and advocacy. And currently, I'm working as a graduate assistant in the Food Justice Project and Community uh, Air Research Experience with Professor Suzla and Professor Jing at Loyola. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to share with you today two different research projects. And as Teresa explained at the start, um, we'll have time for questions. I'll present one of those projects, and then we'll have a, a, a period for, for some questions, and then Diksha will present the second, and we'll have more time for longer discussion to take place. But if you have any immediate questions you wanna raise for clarification, feel free to um, use that raise hand feature within Zoom, and feel free to toss questions into the chat at any point in time, and then we'll respond to those as we're able to. So the research that we're sharing this morning, um, it, sorry, I'm just figuring out how to get, there we go, <laughs> figuring out which uh, device is going to advance my slides. This research emerged from a course that I teach. I teach a course called Solutions to Environmental Problems, and it rotates in theme um, between food systems, water, and climate action. But in the fall of 2020, it focused on food systems. And this is an interdisciplinary and highly applied course. And students work in teams uh, during this course on applied action research projects. So in the fall of 2020, um, I connected with the Chicago Food Policy Action Council. And one of the projects that students in this course completed is the research that I'll be presenting. So I want to acknowledge that there are a whole lot of other people um, who we've um, worked with in various capacities or with whom we've spoken about these ideas. So the ideas that we're presenting are not entirely our own. They're influenced by many others. And uh, I'll provide that disclaimer, you know, what, what's good is likely uh, came from somebody else and, you know, where we may be inaccurate or, um, you know, you have, you, you have critiques, please share those with us. Those, those would be our, our, own, um, our own doing. So there are a number of, of students involved at Loyola, uh, we've also uh, had the assistance of, of faculty at Loyola and a, a research scientist, um, Kelly Garbach at US EPA, who are supporting, uh, Kelly and Maria Acturin are supporting Diksha in her thesis research. Um, a number of individuals who were staffed with CIFPAC at the, the time of this study. 
And then through that work, we connected with the Chicago Region Food System Fund. So staff with Fresh Taste who coordinate that fund have also been invaluable to this work. This work has had um, really no operational funding, um, but we have been fortunate to have funds from internal sources in Loyola that have supported the undergraduate and graduate student researchers involved. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more, what do we mean by this term food system? And what are some characteristics of our dominant industrial food system? And then also um, how uh, this food system was affected by the pandemic and how that in turn affected people. And then we'll move into the two different research projects. And as uh, mentioned earlier, we'll be sure to leave time for, for questions and discussion. So this term food system, um, it may be a, a bit jargony, uh, but it refers to all of the different processes that bring food to our plates. And so that um, begins with, with production and all of the other processes in between, um, the growing, the processing, the packaging, the transporting of food, uh, food preparation, what happens to food and its packaging um, after that food is consumed, and the people who are involved in these processes, the interactions between them, this is the food system. And the system is situated within a larger political, economic, social, and environmental context. And so the food system as a whole involves all of those different processes, the actors within those processes, and the larger systems uh, that both influence the food system and which the actors within that food system may also be working to, to influence to create change. Our dominant food system in the US and increasingly around the globe is highly industrial. It's characterized um, counter to how traditional agriculture emphasizes diversifying crops. Uh, the industrial food system is characterized by specialization. So uh, specializing in soy or corn or potatoes or chickens or hogs. And it's highly dependent upon external inputs fertilizers, pesticides, fossil fuels, credit. Uh, it privileges expert knowledge, technical knowledge, uh, as opposed to the expertise of traditional knowledge holders or the practical knowledge of you know, people who actually work the land. It's highly centralized. Over the last several decades, there's been an increasing consolidation with control uh, of the food system lying in the hands of a small number of large corporations. And it's characterized by competition uh, and policies in a neoliberal framework that um, advantage these large actors over small scale producers. And that's you know, opposite to um, many traditional practices that emphasize uh, cooperation and community. It uh, is based upon the domination of nature and also involves not only the exploitation of, uh, of nature, of animals, um, but uh, of our soils, of our water, uh, but also of people, of laborers, and, um, and a large number of those laborers in the food system are people of color. This system is also permeated by structural racism from discrimination in um, policies uh, such as USDA policies that provide greater access to resources to white farmers than to black and other farmers of color. Um, another you know, example of this is the disparities in food insecurity that exist between white communities and communities of color. This map on the right from the Chicago, uh, Greater Chicago Food Depository shows a relationship between poverty and food insecurity in Cook County. And um, I think everyone here is from the Chicago region, so you're aware that it's a highly segregated region and can see the darkest areas here with high poverty rates are also those on the south and west sides of Chicago, which are black and brown communities. And we know that poverty and race are not um, entirely independent. There's been a, a long history of laws, practices, and social norms that have systematically disadvantaged Afri African Americans, Native Americans, uh, immigrants from Mexico and other countries uh, within Latin America, Asian immigrants. Uh, so a variety of different laws, practices, social norms that have advantaged 
white people over people of color and even at the expense of people of color. In the food system, this you know, stems back centuries to settler colonialism and the dispossession of Native Americans from their lands to the enslavement of Africans and to um, numerous laws and practices that have occurred since that time to continue to alienate people of color from, uh, from the land, from land ownership, um, and from the, the resources needed to thrive within the food and agriculture sector. In resisting that structural racism, there's a growing food justice movement. And um, this movement, at least one of the places where this movement emerged was in response to efforts such as the community food security movement and other sustainable agriculture movements that were uh, predominantly white. And so movements that were attempting to transform that industrial food system that I described earlier to be more equitable and more environmentally sustainable, but movements that were uh, dominated by white faces, white ideas that were coming up with solutions that really reflected white privilege and didn't work very well for black and brown communities. Another related movement is the food sovereignty movement, which was initiated by peasants globally to resist those neoliberal agricultural policies favoring um, privatization, favoring large corporations, and really advocating for the rights of peasants to have access to land, water, credit, to have the right to produce food as they choose to do so, and the right of consumers to be able to decide what they consume, how, and by whom their food is produced. So this industrial food system has been really good at producing cheap food. We have an abundant um, supply of cheap food in the United States, but that has occurred at the expense of people's nutrition and health, the rights of workers, animal welfare, um, the economic well-being of rural economies as um, less money goes back to farmers and more goes to uh, various entities kind of um, selling things like fertilizer and seeds and so forth, and also environmental health, and even the stability of our climate, as this is a system that's heavily dependent upon fossil fuels. So there's a lot of externalities, a lot of expenses that aren't captured in the price of that cheap food. Um, and this is also a system that is highly vulnerable. It's vulnerable to weather, uh, to unexpected shocks like price fluctuations or other economic conditions is susceptible to uh, crop diseases and plants, to climate impacts, and of course, to a disruption such as a global pandemic. So with the outbreak of COVID-19, we saw a variety of immediate impacts on the food system. On the one hand, producers um, who were, you know, had previously been selling to restaurants or other institutional buyers found themselves with excess product as those you know, restaurant schools and other uh, hotels, other institutions were closed and were having to dump um, their products. While we also had an increase in food insecurity, more people who were, you know, because of job loss, um, they were, uh, needing emergency food assistance. And so food pantries, mutual aid associations, churches and others you responding to try and fill this need. And these, while that um, food insecurity rose across all racial groups, it was higher within communities of color. Uh, people of color are more likely to be in jobs that couldn't be removed, uh, couldn't be moved to the Zoom world, you know, couldn't be done remotely from home. So more of them lost their jobs. Uh, people who did not lose their jobs may have been, you know, required to be in person, increasing their risk to the exposure of COVID. And, um, you know, once ill, had limited mobility to obtain food. Of course, the financial considerations, but also uh, research documented that some people did not have access to food due to fears of going out because of anti-Asian xenophobia, because of fears of deportation um, for undocumented immigrants, so a variety of factors. Uh, but what we saw is uh, disruptions both 
um, affecting the livelihoods of producers, disrupting the supply chain, and also this increased um, concern around hunger, increased food insecurity, and that just really highlighted, highlighted the disparities that you know, already existed um, between white communities and, and others. The opposite of this vulnerable system uh, would be a resilient one. There are a number of different definitions of this term resilience, kind of another jargony of word, and it's been used differently um, in various uh, fields of study. But for our purposes, we're thinking of it as the capacity of a food system um, and its units at multiple levels to provide sufficient, appropriate, and accessible food to all in the face of various and even unforeseen disturbances. So it's really the capacity of a system to, um, to respond and continue to function when disturbances occur. In the diagram at the right, we see a cycle that would describe what a resilient uh, food system, how that, that would um, operate when there's a shock such as COVID-19. So when you have a shock, the system would have the ability to, to absorb it or to resist it, to react in ways that allow it to quickly restore and continue to sustain its core functions. That could also be the case for slower moving stressors. So these are you know, variables that are not an immediate shock, but things that are ongoing that you know, are potentially damaging the system, uh, such as policies that restrict access to land and water for urban agriculture. And so a resilient system is one that can adapt, that can pivot, that can continue to um, fulfill the functions that it serves, and that also has the capacity to learn from, um, from those disruptions in order to build future robustness and be able to take more preventative action against the possibility of future disturbances. Oops, sorry, here we go. Okay, so in the Chicago region, there were um, a number of different actors that were responding as the crisis hit. Uh, you know, a lot of mutual aid organizations that um, were, people were coming together within neighborhoods to support one another, to get um, food and other you know, needs such as diapers and so forth to you know, people who needed them. You know, there was a lot of action occurring among nonprofits or um, through mutual aid associations, through churches and others that were filling gaps that the government either wasn't responding to quickly enough or maybe was responding to, but in ways that were really excluding small scale producers and failing to meet the, um, the needs of communities of color. And so um, a lot of work was happening to address these crises. One of the organizations that helped to convene uh, people working across various sectors of the food system at this time is the Chicago Food Policy Action Council. And CIFPAC already played a convening role. Um, you know, they brought people together in various events like their annual Food Justice Summit. But when the pandemic broke out, um, they saw the need to um, help connect people uh, to respond to what was happening on the ground. So at that time, there was a lot of uncertainty. It was very chaotic and they brought people get together to um, just kind of find out what was happening and what um, were the, the, the needs that uh, various organizations could help support. So they did this through virtual working groups that met um, initially weekly and then sometimes you know, bi-weekly, monthly that, that ebbed and flowed over time. There were six initial groups that focused on producers, small businesses, emergency food assistants, food chain workers, funders, and then uh, another uh, group that was kind of connecting across those sectors. And this um, shifted over time as, as some groups um, fell off and merged into others and groups kind of you know, morphed and pivoted and evolved in response to different needs. 
Today, that effort has transformed into what CIFPAC calls the Chicago Food Justice Rhizome Network. And the rhizome calls continue. And there are three um, groups focusing on small businesses, food worker justice, and a resilient food system, which is the, the evolution of the emergency food assistance group. So those are continuing to, um, to do work together today. And in, so this launched in March of 2020. And as I mentioned in the fall of 2020, I was teaching a food systems course and um, connected with CIFPAC. And so students in that course, Maddie Perdue, Rowan Obach and Paulina Vaca, um, Mirage Sheik, who was the systems and strategy director for CIFPAC at that time, and myself co-designed the research that I'm about to describe. And all of the students contributed substantially to this project, but I really want to um, highlight Rowan Obach because she's provided a lot of leadership for it. And actually she'd be the one here presenting, uh, except that she's studying abroad in Rome this semester. And so she's on an entirely different uh, time zone at the moment. So our aim was to increase understanding of what occurred during this rapid response. Um, we wanted to learn more about what impacts people perceived it had, also the challenges that were experienced, particularly by the staff facilitating it, to gain practical feedback from participants about what worked well, what could be improved upon. And we wanted to understand more about people's experience of the, the call space, the culture within the calls, um, particularly as that relates to uh, hierarchies of privilege and oppression and power. Uh, you know, did people feel safe and welcomed in the space or not and why? And we were also curious about people's um, hopes looking forward and the perceived potential of this effort to support longer term transformation in the food system. So we chose to address those aims through what researchers call narrative methodology, or in just more uh, straightforward everyday language to collect stories. And we chose to use stories as our data collection method because they are a very powerful form of communication and they can help us to understand complexity in a particular situation. They allow access to the professional craft and experiential knowledge of people who are working on the ground that would otherwise be invisible to you know, folks outside of that particular situation. So we opted to use stories rather than a method such as surveys because we were really interested in collecting rich data about people's experiences in the rapid response effort that would help us better understand its impacts and we drew upon um, a resource guide that's available online from uh, faculty at Cornell University that provides some um, instructions for how to go about collecting practice stories from the field. The students and myself interviewed um, five CIFPAC staff. So we had really good coverage um, in terms of, uh, we spoke to, to virtually everyone who was involved uh, in facilitating rapid response calls. And we also spoke to five participants. Um, and so here we do not have very good coverage. We spoke to five participants, but there are hundreds of people who engage with these calls at different points in time. But we still got you know, some interesting insights and I'll, I'll share those with you. We asked um, slightly different questions uh, given the different roles that folks had um, in the effort. Uh, but from staff, we really focused on um, their specific roles, how the working groups formed and evolved over time, the challenges they experienced, what they perceived as benefits of the um, effort and examples of specific impacts they had observed, their longer term hopes for where the effort might lead, how their identity informs the work and what they find most meaningful in the work. For participants, we also asked how they got involved, what motivated them, um, what types of connections they made, what impacts they perceived, um, the calls may have helped support within their community, how participating influenced their own understanding of the food system, logistical feedback, and um, again, how the space felt to them. We conducted the interviews, audio recorded them, transcribed them, and then um, edited that transcript into a 
story format. And so this is one example from one of the participants. And you can see here, um, you know, it starts with how this person got involved with the rapid response effort. This person had just begun at their organization. Their boss told them, you need to hop on these calls. And so initially this person is just, you know, wanting to understand what's going on, who are the players, building relationships. This person notes in the second paragraph, they were really involved in the local food producers group. Over time, that sort of fizzled out. Um, and so you can see here just the way in which we're gaining a story. It's highlighting what was of value to the participant. It's giving a sense of the evolution of the effort. And um, you know, at the bottom, this is not the end of the story. Each of the stories was three to eight pages long, um, but it's also giving you a sense like of the, the value in terms of there is a, a way to connect, to come together, to talk when there's so much uncertainty. So there's a lot I could say in terms of the results, um, but I'm going to highlight just two key takeaways that we found to be especially important. One of those, was the value of the relationships that were either strengthened or created through this effort. So this is a diagram that Rowan produced based upon the interviews with the five call participants. It reflects organizations that they were affiliated with and other organizations that they were um, working with through these calls to uh, implement tangible projects like surveying regarding what are the impacts of COVID um, so that in various um, communities in order to be able to better respond to those, uh, distributing personal protective equipment, connecting people who had that PPE to the people who could use it, um, connecting people to cold storage uh, for their food. So this is by no means comprehensive. It's from just the five interviews. And even within those interviews, I'm sure this does not represent all of the different connections that exist between the folks we interviewed and others with whom they're working. But it does um, really highlight that those relationships, those connections uh, were important in, um, in then enabling practical action. This diagram uh, Rowan created based upon the stories that we collected from CIFPAC staff. And um, this is kind of taking more of a bird's eye view. Again, it's incomplete, um, but it's you know, giving a sense of the way in which the different working groups in red in the center brought together actors across various sectors of the food system in purple. And those actors, some of which you see in the, the bold, um, you know, they're directly named because they were mentioned multiple times by different, uh, in, in different stories that we collected. Um, and again, this is not complete. Many other actors were involved, uh, you, but these actors were working together to create tangible impacts um, that you were know, providing food to other nonprofits who could distribute within communities that were providing monetary support, staff support, expanding PPE distribution, um, contributing to re research, uh, and so forth. So the, the idea here is visually representing the way in which collaborations that either you know, arose from existing relationships or from people connecting in new ways who would not have previously known of each other, whether that's connecting across sectors or connecting across communities of the Chicago region, enabled um, a stronger response to the pandemic's impacts. So um, there's a sense not only among CIFPAC staff, but also from uh, several of the participants whom we interviewed that these networks could outlast uh, the pandemic itself. Not all these relationships will you know, continue, uh, but some of them certainly uh, can. And there was a sense from um, both staff and participants that these networks are helping to build power among smaller actors within the food system to counteract existing power structures and helping to build the capacity to adapt to future disruptions. So uh, this is very positive. But on the other hand, there was a fundamental challenge experienced and that related to the institutional racism that I discussed earlier. 
And this is really um, highlighted in the words of a, a grower um, who's an immigrant and spoke about feeling that the call space, while this individual felt sufficiently comfortable speaking up in the space, that the space could be really intimidating to others, um, that, the, that there was a disconnect between conversations occurring in the calls and what was really happening, the experiences and what was really happening on the ground in black and brown communities in, in the Chicago region. So this grower says, um, the college showed me a lot of the advocacy organizations, they need to do a lot of internal processing. How do they engage with the community? What is their mission? How are they centering the people that they say they're working with? How are they giving those folks that they say that they work with a space in their decision-making, not just using them as images or tokenizing their work? As farmers, we get reached out a lot by organizations. They want to hear from us, they want to talk to us, and we have great ideas but you're not compensating me for my time. It just feels really extractive. So this participant also shared kind of a sense that there was, you know, that the calls were becoming an echo chamber, that the people who were most impacted by COVID-19 were not adequately represented. CIFPAC staff also um, you had observed this, they had observed some of these dynamics. And one of the ways that they responded was by working with an external consultant to provide interrogating whiteness workshops to white participants in the cause. And when we interviewed um, participants who identify as white, the ones, those who had participated in this um, had found it really helpful. And so this is one step um, and continuing um, to, to focus on anti-racist uh, education for white participants has been an important part of CIFPAC's work. So um, what I want to suggest in terms of implications of the, uh, the key learning that we took away from these stories as we kind of looked across the full set of stories is that although the, the disruptions from the pandemic have been, you know, have been uh, really traumatic, but also have opened opportunities to reorganize the local regional food system um, toward one that is just and resilient. So this was a sentiment, um, particularly among CIFPAC staff and some of the participants. So there's opportunity to really create longer term systemic change. And that networks, those relationships play a really important role in that. But because the food system exists within their broader uh, social, political, economic context, because our local regional food system is situated within the national and global food system, um, all of this is you know, permeated by structural racism. So those networks are likely to reproduce existing power dynamics that, um, that favor white uh, communities, white actors, organizations that are predominantly white um, you know, over people of color, unless there's intentional action taken to shift those power dynamics. And this call is, is directed um, you know, to take that intentional action that is directed at myself, folks like myself um, and other uh, people who are white that are situated in various organizations roles, whether at universities, nonprofits and government um, to be much more intentional about uh, stepping back, listening, educating ourselves, really um, learning from the super valuable leadership that is occurring in black and brown communities. And so the last um, point that I will share is just this uh, opportunity to learn. Uh, we feel like through these uh, stories that we gathered of the rapid response effort, it just opened our thoughts that there is so much more that we can learn from the various people who have been working on the ground to address the crises that arose through COVID-19. And so I'm going to now um, take a, offer a few minutes for some questions and some feedback, and then we'll shift into uh, a second project that Diksha is leading with um, the Chicago Region Food System Fund. I want to open for any um, 
Any questions or comments? We can also save those for the end. I think we can probably just go ahead here. Sounds people good. Can, people can always drop the questions in the uh, chat if they wish to, <laughs> to not have to speak. Sounds good. Okay. Dickshaw hands Dick the to you. Thank you so much, Professor Sisler. And you, yes, as we discussed about the COVID and the disruption in the food system, uh, for the second project, I'll be talking about um, nonprofit organizations and their role for food security in the context of COVID. Okay, so uh, let us talk about the nonprofit organizations. So even um, uh, in the absence of disaster, uh, the nonprofit organizations, the role of nonprofit organization was significant in ensuring that food is available to everyone through various programs that help to connect um, producers and consumers, and also target and also they were targeting the um, um, low low income households and uh, people of color. So, so in disaster strike, those organizations enhance their capacity. So they act; they can act as first responder and immediately support, uh, uh, immediately support uh, community with the uh, resources within their capacity, while the more stable sources are on their way. So, according to one of the studies, it was found that uh, nonprofit organizations support local communities during disaster through emergency management or disaster relief programs. So, however, those organizations who were the immediate point of support at the time of pandemic were at the time uh, of at the time of uh, disaster were also impacted by the COVID. So, within the first few weeks of uh, pandemic, organization experienced unexpected shocks, and uh, which disrupted their programmatic activities and also sometimes to operate. It was because of the obvious. Uh, problems like lockdown, uh, supply chain disruptions, and the fear of infection. So, the human service nonprofits like food banks, uh, social groceries, and other food based organizations experience rapid rise in demand for food assistance, especially among those communities who are already struggling with food, including people of color and low income households. So, as we discussed earlier, when disasters strike, uh, those uh, non-profit organizations support people in need. But in case of pandemic, in case of the uh, COVID, which was unprecedented, uh, the problem was amplified. The number of vulnerable population expanded and the capacity of those organizations shrunk. So also the other way, as we also we discussed in earlier size, the other way they could have uh, uh, worked efficiently by was by collaborating with other organizations by sharing resources and knowledge. So, for example, one of the study was uh, one study has found that the online community network has helped to promote food uh, promote resilient food systems by uh, identifying the potential local growers, which would help to meet the need in uh, need of food in community. So, um, unfortunately, during the initial days of COVID, even those possibilities were shrunk due to the restriction of communication and transportation imposed by lockdown. So according to one of the studies, um, it was found that nonprofit organizations had um, no time to uh, communicate with each other in the earlier days. And they, were, they had no idea about the, what new practices the organizations were adopting to cope up with this um, shock. So this overall summarizes my motivation to carry out this research. I aim to study the experiences of those organizations and uh, study the cases of the struggles and how they cope up with those um, struggles and challenges while implementing the program in the face of pandemic. So let me quickly share like how I ended to this, how I landed to this research. Um, as we discussed, like the COVID has caused disruption to the food system, 
So in response to that in Chicago, Chicago Region Food System Fund was launched to address hunger and business disruption. So the, uh, the grant recipients were mostly nonprofit organizations, fed communities, food banks, and other uh, frontline institutions. The fund was dispersed in several roundings, uh, in several rounds, and my recent uh, my research pertains to two of those rounds. The first one is response round, which was provided in 2020. In this round of funding, um, 80 different nonprofit organizations were supported uh, with the aim to provide immediate support, food uh, immediate food needs to the communities who were in need. And and the other round is resilience round of funding, which was provided in 2021. So in this round of funding, 48 organizations were um, supported uh, with the aim to uh, promote food system resilience and meet the present and future food needs. Uh, so those organizations whom I will also be calling grantees in the presentation submitted reports sharing the stories about the experiences and challenges to the funders. So I'll be synthesizing those reports to identify patterns within their stories. Uh, to answer my research questions, which are as follows. So most, my first research question is how did nonprofit organizations in Chicago region respond to food insecurity and other disruptions during the pandemic and food disruption during the pandemic? And my second question is what social networks supported nonprofit organizations effort to respond to food system uh, disruptions during pandemic? And my third question is how are these organizations using their experiences to develop future resilience um, in the food sector within local communities. So starting with the work that I have done so far, which also answers a portion of my research question one. Uh, in fall 2021, I organized grantees uh, reports from response round of funding in using NVivo software, where I identify patterns within the stories about contribution to communities impacted by COVID, the challenges and lessons learned, modification in work in response to COVID, impact of their work in local food system, and how they strengthen their business model to the connection with other organizations. So here's a screenshot um, of the software, just to give you a sense that how it looked like. So here are some of the results. Um, uh, the different organizations worked in different sector and they had unique contributions. So I have summarized all of them to present these results. Uh, the organization mentioned that the, they, uh, they increased the uh, food production capacity uh, of the community members uh, by providing technical support and also educating them about the nutritious food. And they also mentioned that they have this have increased the confidence in uh, in the people in community, and they are no more confident of growing food within the limited resources they have. And also, organizations uh, reported that this fund has increased uh, their capacity of distributing the food. Organizations were so attentive about the food restriction of food, uh, of the recipient that they uh, prepare and distributed the food that that would best fit an individual. So knowing that it is of no sense to distribute food that uh, food or ingredients that communities are unaware about. So uh, the, the organizations, the many organizations re reported that they established new relationship in community. So which has also increased the potential of collaborating with um, other organizations, for example, food banks, uh, uh, local farmers, local stores, universities, hospitals, and other and other organizations. So, and one of the organizations also mentioned that uh, this has increased a, a sense of caring the community. And now the people, now people come forward and help each other by providing emotional and physical support. So many of the organizations also mentioned that this fund has helped them to uh, create an example of how open spaces can be used during emergencies, either to produce food or to exchange information and resources. So one of the organizations mentioned that the uh, garden uh, maintained by them was helpful to tackle loneliness during the time of pandemic, especially among the people of color. So they also mentioned that they contributed to um, those community by supporting local garden, uh, local business and gardens. Uh, they 
provided infrastructural support to uh, small scale uh, food business in the community and also increase the wellness and nutrition nutrition program and which also helped them to increase food um, uh, which also helped them to increase the uh, quality and quantity of food so uh, the grantees mentioned that the partnership was very, really very helpful to uh, increase the amount of food as they um, as they included items fresh uh, fresh items from the farmers and also the donated menu items from restaurants in the in the meal that they distributed in the community so um, so from the report of the grant uh, of those grantees it was found that they provided service to diverse groups in the community for example one of the grantees mentioned that they uh, with collaboration with the governmental organization they were able to provide uh, irrigational facilities to uh, local farmers so similarly other grantees mentioned that uh, they were able to support food production workers by advocating for their uh, wages and also protection in the face of pandemic so Yes, also um, a few grantees mentioned that they were able to connect people and uh, uh, people and farmers by, by expanding the farmers market. And in terms of the financial support, uh, the grantees reported it in two ways. Like for example, um, some of the grantees mentioned that the partnership and the network was helpful for them to um, uh, collect more funds to fundraising programs and also they got more donations that that was helpful to distribute more foods so at the same time they, some of the grantees mentioned that they provided uh, employment opportunities for those who lost their job due to pandemic so uh, so they provided those employment or financial support in terms of uh, temporary uh, job opportunities or one-time assistance or also helping them uh, in the rental um, assistance so some of the uh, grantees in their report included the quotes from the food recipients and I have included some in the slides. Uh, I'll give you a minute to go through it. Yeah. So, so what were the challenges the grantees experienced? Uh, one of the obvious challenges was lockdown as uh, many staffs took leave from their work either to take care of the family members who were infected by COVID or to fulfill the quarantine rules. And um, also those who were healthy were not willing to show up to work because uh, they were because of the fear of infection and similarly due to the lockdown and the market closure there was um, uh, um, changes in market management and at the same time there was increase in the price of food and uh, other uh, other packaging materials which also increases the overall project expenses so the other challenge the grantees reported was operational and logistical challenges. So some of them mentioned that due to lack of communication between the, com the members in communities and the food deliver uh, deliver uh, uh, um, and the one who delivers food, there uh, there were times then that when they had to cancel the food delivery, and also sometimes those uh, those recipients visited to wrong address to receive the food. So, uh, and also um, uh, many grantees mentioned that the stores were not able to provide, uh, the stores were not able to provide materials that would meet the need of grantees. And similarly, some of the grantees mentioned that uh, they had the problem of cold storage uh, in the distribution side, and also the food recipient did not have any refrigerator in the house. So, so what happened was, due to this they had to distribute all the food on, on the same day or the food was wasted and this also added additional work to those grantees because they had to ensure uh, not distributing uh, that not ensure that homeless are not provided the, with the food that requires refrigeration so so we have been uh, talking about the uh, staff the uh, lack of volunteers like the grantees 
had also difficulty in managing the volunteers and also uh, due to not having social service expertise in the team, uh, they, they were unable to have the recent demographic information of the new communities where they were expanding their services. So similarly, the transportation, uh, they had difficulty in delivering food in the spread out community as they lack adequate transportation. And also they had difficulty to providing food to those uh, to the senior citizens who were unable to visit the distribution site. And some of the grantees mentioned that they uh, due, due to uh, since the uh, disposable packaging materials were not available, they ended up using the non recyclable uh, packaging, which also made their food distribution less sustainable. So another major challenge that the grantees reported was the cultural and demographic challenges. Uh, for example, some of the grantees mentioned that uh, they had difficulty in finding a specific type of meat like halal meat to distribute among the immigrants and refugees community. So also uh, some grantees who had no plan of distributing of providing um, food at their home, like, like distributing food to their homes had to plan because um, some, some, some portion of population were reluctant to visit to the distribution site. So what were the strategies that they used to overcome those challenges was, uh, many grantees reported that they started making the wise use of, wise use of human resources. Uh, for example, they, uh, they provided stipend to local youth leaders who, who would help them to, you know, plan and, uh, uh, reach out to people in reach out to people in communities and also confirm food and help and and provide logistical support during the time of food distribution. And um, also, they mentioned that they made the time uh, flexible, the the working hours flexible, so that the uh, so that it was easier for them to manage all those uh, available human resources. And also, they mentioned that they were uh, they started to train recent graduates and um, train them to. Uh, from the beginning, like so train them to prepare, pack, and distribute food in the community, so which was really very helpful for them to manage the resources. So the second strategy that Grant mentioned was the uh, use of social media as a solution. So, um, so Grant started identifying people uh, who were in need of food by using social media and sorting out the information, and they also uh, provided information about the food distribution side by announcing it in the social media. And also some of the grantees started using uh, Google signing, so which made them easier to um, uh, manage the list of the food recipients. And also uh, uh, one of the grantees mentioned that they, uh, they allowed for online reservation. So that was very helpful for them to you know, estimate the number of food recipients that might be visiting to the uh, food distribution site. So the most important, uh, strategy uh, mentioned by most of the grantees was the effective coordination and partnership. So, um, for example, the uh, the problem of cold stories was solved when the uh, when they coordinated with local business and um, uh, local food business, which allowed them to use the uh, uh, stories cold stories facilities uh, in actions of stipend. So also. Uh, Few grantees mentioned that the the coordinate the, their coordination with the uh, farmer farm the, the local farmers help them to uh, help them to include those uh, fresh produce in the uh, fresh produce in the meals they distributed and also those farmers provided uh, some of them provided catering services so which really made the the food distribution easier for them. So moving ahead with what uh, what they did further was uh, they modified also they modified their work as one of the strategies to work on the challenges. For example, the grantees who were educating children uh, about produce uh, about cooking and planting healthy foods uh, by providing hands on uh, hands on uh, knowledge in the garden you know, shifted virtual. So so now they provided online resources where the kids and uh, where the kids were able to grow in their uh, own house in their own house by using the online those online resources and also one of the grantees um, um, started a virtual uh, platform 
as a, I would say, like virtual um, market platform with an alternative to connect uh, producers and consumers. So in this virtual platform, they uh, they included the list a list of um, things that are available, the, the list of products that are available, and they provided information of how to order them. And also they, they included a website of uh, each vendors and also their social media account. So, uh, so grantees believe that this helped them, this helped to connect the people to the uh, vendors. So, and yes, also the many of the grantees reported that they modified the food delivery system in response to the pandemic, for example, uh many grantees uh, created this uh, sidewalk pickup and also drive through food delivery system so this helped them to distribute food to large number of people within a, within a limited time and also maintain social distancing and um, at the same time some of the grantees uh, mentioned that they started ordering food twice a month uh, uh like they started ordering for twice a month rather than just once where they're expanding their services in new communities so these analyses help me to identify my uh, other research questions which i mentioned earlier so what will i be doing next is uh, i'll be using a mixed method to answer these questions so um, yeah, these are the two, the research question two and three were identified after the analysis that after the uh, after analyzing the reports. Uh, and then now, now further, I'll be using the mixed methods to answer these questions, which are as follows. So the first one is I'll be reviewing the um, uh, document to examine the narration written in the uh, written in the document, which are the reports from those grantees. Uh, and I'll be focusing on the work done to promote food system resilience and, and my data sources would obviously be those uh, the reports from those um, ATA organizations who were funded at the time of uh, during the response round of funding and 48 organizations were funded during the resilience round of funding. And the other method that we'll be using that I'll be using is a focus group discussion, which is a qualitative uh, method of collecting data um in informal group discussion and talking uh within uh, um, involving uh involving small group of people and talking about a specific topic so in the focus group discussion i'll be focusing mostly on uh the future vision for food system resilience from the perspective of programmatic uh, programmatic staffs and representative of organizations and who will be those organizations are uh will we we will be meeting organizations with uh who are like with more than 50 percent of bipoc populations in um uh, in their staffs or uh, board of directors or in the teams so the organizations will be categorized based on the project that they uh, that they mentioned that they will be doing uh, by the use of the fund. So mostly those categories are those organizations who support to local food uh, related business. And the other category would be like uh, the, those who work in the sector of advocacy, training and education. And the other category, and other category will be the networking, the organizations who work uh, more with network uh, in networking, communication and collaboration. And the next category would be the organizations who will be serving specific demographic group and, uh, and uh, distributing culture, culturally appropriate foods. And the other method, which I'll be using is social network analysis, which is a method to describe interaction among different uh, um, participants, groups, or organizations in a community, which is a quantitative method. And I'll be, and in this method, I'll be mostly focusing on what were the food actors that were important during this collaboration uh, while implementing the program. So yes, the uh, data sources for this analysis will also be those um, reports from response and resilience round. So by using this method, I hope to come up with recommendation that might be helpful um, uh, to you know, address such challenges in future. Yeah. So, thank you so much. And yes, questions and feedbacks are welcome. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, fascinating work. Uh,
we'll throw it open to questions, reactions. Um, I have more of a comment or an addition. Um, when I was at Care for Real on Wednesday, a woman came in and she said, um, I speak Russian and I'm wondering if you'll need help in translating when you start getting uh, Ukrainians in here, you know, who are gonna need services. So, and I know there was a woman who used to work there who was Iranian and she used to do a lot of translating. So I think this is another thing that it's, that people don't know how to get the resources. People don't know how to communicate what they need when they get to places where they can get food and clothing and things. So I, I just had, hadn't thought of it. So I thought it was an interesting um, observation while, while I was there. Thank you for sharing that. I think that aligns with some of what Diksha read in reports from, um, from organizations that were specifically um, engaging with refugee populations. And that's a, a huge challenge in, in terms of language and other um, you know, barriers that exist to people accessing resources. This is our first time presenting this work like to an external audience where people you know weren't somehow involved or, or somewhat familiar with it so um, we're, questions are welcome but we're also just you know very interested in just hearing your reactions your thoughts what resonated what was confusing. <laughs> um, yeah we welcome feedback. I, I appreciated uh, both of you you know sort of backing up a little bit and setting the setting the table, kind of giving us the where this where this all fits in, what the what the terms are. You know, I think we all have some familiarity, some of us more than others, with with the work, but it's always helpful to kind of uh, clarify uh, definitions and and um, kind of the, the lay of the land as it were. So it, sometimes when you're talking to to folks internally so often that you don't remember to do that. So I appreciate it that you kind of put that out for us. Is there, I just got a question for you about, about um, support for this work. I mean, are, are there other outside agencies, funders that um, you all have approached or thought of approaching, or you can tell that this is also a, a not so subtle hook for how might curl be helpful? Yeah, so, um, so we have not yet approached uh, external funders. We do have some internal funding from Loyola's Office of Research Services, and one of the expectations of that <laughs> is that the you know it's sort of to to fund pilot work that um, that then can lead to uh, securing external funds. So I very much would like to work on funding proposals, and it'd be great to to collaborate with Curl. And I hope to you know, there are. Um, we talked about the importance of networks. There's the, the MSURF network, which I cannot recall precisely what the acronym um, stands for, but it's, it's something that uh, I know Steph is helping to facilitate Howard Rosing at DePaul University is one of the people who founded that. And that's researchers bringing together researchers across various universities and other settings, as well as practitioners to um, either ensure that research has practical relevance. And so I'm really interested in um, in better connecting uh, myself and, you know, prediction of the opportunity to, to connect even more with people who are doing this work and, and hear more about the research questions that are of interest to them, and then use that to prepare external funding proposals. And, and I hope to be working on that more in the fall, David, so I will definitely be communicating with you. You, you know where to find us. I know for me, I really enjoyed um, in your presentation, the the quotes that people had about, um, I really like that aspect, kind of like bringing in um, people, like how people going through it, see it. Uh, so yeah, I think that that was a really nice, uh, like other way of looking at it and kind of like putting that with the data. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, I have a question that you might not be able to answer, but um, speaking of like resiliency in the food network and, you know, supply chain and all of this, um, there's news that we're going to have wheat issues coming up here um, with the turmoil in Europe. Um, have you heard anything from any of your partners or anything about how that's all going to play out in um, like everything we've seen that's happened with COVID and, and all, of, all the research you've done already? I guess the short answer would be no. <laughs> um, I, 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 well, so it's you, you, a lot of the um, the conversations that we had, like the the interviews and so forth that that Rowan and Paulina and I conducted, predate the um, the Russian invasion of of Ukraine. From and so in some ways we just may not, you know, if those conversations are happening, it just may be that we haven't heard them, uh, but. Also, in, in terms of just you know reading the the news as well around that situation, I think that there are you know, some uh, countries, uh, other you know countries that are even more dependent upon um, the Russian exports of wheat that will be impacted more so uh, than our region might be. But I think that's another really good example of a shock <laughs> that then ripples through the global food system and um, and you know emphasizes the importance of thinking about how we can strengthen our regional food systems so that we are able to better withstand those types of disturbances. Um, yeah, thanks for raising that, Teresa. Sorry, I can't tell you more. I think it's interesting that there's, um, been a lot more push to have local community gardens, more places where we can actually produce food in our neighborhoods. And um, it's difficult to get projects like that going during a pandemic. But, you know, I, um, I noticed that a couple of the schools in our neighborhood um, I just grown up in weeds and I thought initially, oh, it'd be nice to plant flowers in there to get a community group together to plant flowers. But after today, I'm thinking, I wonder if, if those would be good places where we could plant community gardens, where we could have, you know, be raising food that, you know, that people in the immediate area, even if it was kind of pilfered, at least it, it would be available to people and it would be local and it would be, an education for children to start learning how to grow. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Carol. And I think as you, um, you, you said, there's a lot involved in creating a community garden and there's some good resources um, through organizations like Neighbor Space or the Peterson Garden Project and others. So I think if, uh, I, I like that idea of, you know, Beautifying with flowers is great, but then making that really useful by growing food is great. And I think if, if you know, I would recommend for anybody who is going to embark on that to try and learn from the people who have already done it to anticipate what types of obstacles might arise and how you could best overcome those. Other questions, comments, reactions? I'll just say one more thing building off of that. So the, the work to you know, grow food in garden in community gardens and school gardens and so forth, super, super important. And then we're like, I'm really interested in kind of learning more about the ways in which people are developing um, for-profit farms and also other food enterprises and really creating you know, food-based small businesses in order to provide um, you know, good livelihoods and kind of build the, the economic um, aspect of this work as well. And I think that that might be uh, an, another important component of, um, of creating this resilient food system. Uh, so we will, um, I'm sure have more that we can share in the future. Diksha's uh, 
recently defended her proposal for her thesis research and shared with you today uh, you know, some of the, the analyses that she initially did that informed the future direction she's headed. Uh, but we anticipate having a, a lot more to share like this winter, next spring, after we've had opportunity to um, talk more directly with folks engaged in this work through the focus groups and also to look at the reports that are submitted by the grantees of the Chicago Region Food System Fund uh, in the 2021 round of funding where the focus was on um, continuing to respond to the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also looking toward longer term systemic change. So uh, I just wanna, uh, of course, if there are other questions or comments, happy, happy to talk more, but I just wanna say how grateful we are for the opportunity to share with you the work we've done to date. And um, you know, we'll look forward to, to sharing more as we're further along in the, the research. I have one more question, I'm sorry. Great. Um, we just got connected at home here uh, with Waste Not, right? The, the compost uh, a system. Has, has that come into any of your research as well? Like that end of the food, of the food system and what happens with all the, the scraps to keep them out of the, out of the landfills? Yeah, that has come up. Um, so that's a really important aspect because there's a large portion of um, food waste that uh, yeah, a food that is simply wasted. And, um, you know, some of that is from in our homes as we toss stuff out. And some of that is on the farm and at various stages through the, the processing uh, process and so forth. And there are some organizations that are uh, very focused on food waste. And um, in the one, so one of those is uh, seven generations, but there are others. And um, one of the initiatives that came up in, in a story that we collected that you know, Rowan had included in that first network diagram I showed was a food rescue hub. So it was a place to bring, uh, you know, like where there was food remaining that people, you know, like food people had um, that they weren't able to, to distribute somewhere to have a hub to bring all that together where then organizations that are distributing emergency food could come to you know, access that food and get it out into communities. So there's, um, yeah, so I think that that's an area that's often overlooked, but one that's getting increasing attention. And I know that there are some really strong um, advocates for better managing our food waste um, who are doing really good work in, in the Chicago region. Good. Thank you so much. People don't have to flee the room just as we're wrapping it up, but I do want to, you know, thank you both. This was a fascinating work, uh, very interesting to hear more. And, and actually, um, offline at some point, um, Tanya and Victor, we should talk about work that Curl did in years, and I hate to say it, even decades past about uh, food security uh, and the like. So um, I think many of those partners um, are probably included in your partners, but. Uh, always good to, to make some connections. So, but thank you both. And uh, we look forward to, to hearing more about this. And thanks to everybody for, uh, for joining us this morning and, and have a good weekend. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, as Professor Susla mentioned, like this was the, I am new to the food system and also new to the US. So this was a great opportunity to, you know, share my research. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>